what we're trying to build with our clients is that they have a frictionless customer journey. We try to make our clients, our small and medium business clients, see their company almost through the perspective of one customer. How does one customer move through your entire set of processes perfectly? Welcome back to Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge. Uh, today we have a guest. His name is Pete Romano. Welcome to the show, Pete. Hey, Mike. It's really great to be here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's nice to have you. Um, so let's get started. We'll talk about, we'll start off with, um, tell me a little bit about your company, Segwick, and what you do. Hey, and so um, Segwick has been my entrepreneurial passion project for the last 10 years. I always had uh, a big place in my heart for the small business brethren that we have all around us, businesses that you could walk in on on Main Street uh, and just walk up to the owner and start uh, start dealing with them. Uh, I always felt that uh, through a sense of justice that these hardworking business owners needed uh, support that uh, was only accessible to, to their corporate uh, competitors. And so uh, being a corporate slave early on myself and learning a lot of valuable skills through that, I dedicated myself to building a company and building a tool where I can steer uh, talent and resources in that direction to help with uh, marketing, but more importantly, operations and uh, ultimately scalability. Uh, but the solution that we're really looking for is that the small business owner just gets a little bit of stress off. They're they're the hardest working people out there putting in 10, 12, 14 hours a day of work. And just with a few tweaks to their day-to-day -day behaviors, just a few tweaks to how they look at their business, they're going to be able to just get back to their family, get back to their kids, and just live a better life. Like if a company was interested in working with you, what does a typical engagement look like? Like how do you approach that? Companies that work with us oftentimes are at their wits end. They've um, they're they're growing. Uh, they're they're like a uh, an infant who's outgrowing their infant clothes, and they're just stretching out, and and it's causing all sorts of stresses on various departments. And so, what we do is we we try to figure out well. Uh, what what are the highest priorities? What are the the major things to that we need to fix? And and we observe everything as um as a set of trigger points. What we're trying to build with our clients is that they have a frictionless customer journey. We try to make our clients, our small and medium business clients, see their company almost through the perspective of one customer. How does one customer move through your entire set of processes? perfectly. When they arrive at your website, what happens? When they call into your call center, what happens? When they meet with you, what happens? And if you can string together all of those different points along the customer journey and figure out how to latch every single moment together with an automation or a human training, then you've built the perfect frictionless customer journey. Now you have the basis on which to scale. And so we identify what that looks like, and we begin to impose what that looks like onto a piece of software. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I, I'm a big, I'm a big believer um, in automation, having processes for things. It doesn't even have to be an automated process. Um, we have we have virtual assistants that help us with our business, and everything that they need to do is documented step by step, so that if a new person comes right. in and has to do it, just give it to them, and. I loved your analogy of like an infant growing out of its clothing because it's true. Like, especially I remember having little kids and like, they'd have those one piece outfits and then right. all, and they grow so dang fast. And all of a sudden you're like, my God, why is it so hard to pull this thing on? You know? And then you realize right. they've outgrown it. Um, and they're stretching it in all different places. And I think that's what processes help you avoid, right? Is as you grow, you update your processes to, to grow with you or hopefully you created them so that they grow with you. And um, you, as you bring in more help, you can just hand these SOPs off to people and make sure they're doing it correctly, you do the training, um, but then they can just run with it and the questions are answered, they're already there. So um, what do you help clients with like SOP creation and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, so we'll oftentimes get into mapping and we, 
there, there's a sort of there's, there's a sort of go to standard set of tactics that that we go to. We collect contacts. We we make people understand. Oftentimes, these business owners are just working in Excel. All of their contacts are in different spreadsheets on some sort of Microsoft Drive or on some sort of Google Drive, and that's how they've been running their business for for twenty years. And we figure out where are all those contacts. Let's bring those into the system. Okay, so then what are all of the services that you offer? Okay. Let's write all of those down and let's now really break down those services because oftentimes the, the clients that we're working with, they don't have these SOPs written down. They're a small business owner and really most small business owners, even if you have employees and they have titles, oftentimes they're really just treated as assistance to the founder, as assistance to the owner because the owner is just on a day-to-day -day basis in an improvised way, kind of dictating the flow of that day. Oh, this needs to happen or this needs to happen. It's a very reactive environment. And what we try to do with our clients is say, well, let's try to stop uh, reacting. And that's really hard for a person like me because I see the guitars behind you. I was a rocker. I was a jazzer. I didn't build a CRM platform because I was organized. I build it because I like to improvise. And uh, and that's the opposite of what you need in a growing business. And so I built this software to help other people who are equally as unorganized as I used to be figure out how do I organize my day-to-day -day life and make a business that can be completely separated from me. And so to answer your question about the SOPs, um, well, I think that we dive even just deeper. We, we help figure out how, how do you want to sell that service? Like, did you know that you could sell that as a subscription? Did you know that maybe if you tweak uh, this payment method that the customer might enjoy it a little bit more? And so, um, you know, we, it's much deeper than just the step-by-step. -step. It's really full customer experience. That's, that's excellent because most people don't even understand that. And they're shocked by the smallest things that make a customer go away from their website or whatever it is they're trying to attract them to, um, be it a video or whatever. Um, there's right. little things that will just chase them away that you could easily tweak and keep them around. And people don't understand that. So having somebody... I think people are starting to learn more and more that they can't be experts in everything, no matter how hard they try. And it's better to find people like you and I who have our own areas of expertise to help them. It may, like, I know they look at the price tag at first and they go, oh my gosh, like that's a lot of money I'm spending. Right. But I think if they were to think about the amount of money they're losing and how much money they're spending, banging their head against a wall, trying to fix a problem that they don't know how to fix, um, it's a cheap investment for long-term return on investment. I mean, I just feel like that. Yeah, well, I, I look at every business and I try to help them imagine what does this look like when you're a hundred times as big? What would that look like? Even if you don't want to be that way, if you were, what would that look like in terms of day-to-day -day processes and what sort of steps would you need to have in place in order to serve that volume of clients and then we build that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting approach. I mean, I, I've actually, as a business coach for years, I've helped various businesses scale, like when I worked with entrepreneurs. And I had, I used a really simple approach. I had them create what I called a, a process org chart. So mm -hmm. just, here's an org chart. Show me all everything that, it, that your business needs in order to run. And right. then what, what processes have you got in place? Put those in there. And then I asked the same question as you. Now, uh, if you're going to grow a hundred times, are these all going to still work? Right. You know, maybe maybe but, you have gaps that you're not aware of, you know? It, I learned something really early on, especially when I was building software, was that um, the, the path to growth in terms of day-to-day -day operations, maybe the growth could be linear if you could hope, or it could be more like a hockey stick or whatever that growth pattern is. But along the way, the mechanics of your business are not that linear. The, the operations that are in place when you're serving 10 clients a month or 20 are very, very different than the mechanics that are going to be in place when you're serving 100. And so your, your company is entirely different. And you have to start to think again, like what, what does that look like? And it's the same as... Uh, if you're building a house or if you're building a car, you can't just take a uh, 
uh, an engine that was built for a, a Ford and just sort of add more volume to it to make it work for a truck than add more volume to it to make the, the, the whole structure changes at a certain point and then the whole structure changes again. And so if we can identify what those look like and, and begin to work on getting towards that, then the business is going to benefit. I I do a lot of NetSuite development. So I get a lot of companies that work with ERPs. And that's one of the things that they're always shocked to discover is that, oh, everything, when, when we were doing this much money per month, everything was really simple. Like we, we could have the packages pre-packaged, et cetera. Now we're going crazy trying to keep up. Well, yeah, it's because you have to, now you got to redo the process so that right. it now takes into account the new volume of sales that you're doing. I think that's a, that's a really good piece I, of insight right there. I have a great analogy for you is that, um, and I'm seeing this more and more as, as I work with the complex service providers is that um, every time there's a process and there's a human handoff. It's like trying to take two bottles and balance the bottles on top of their necks, like this way. And then, because that, that's the handoff. That's how fragile that handoff is, because you have one human who's trying to communicate to the next human in a set of steps. And now you add a third human. And so an example might be you're doing marketing and uh, you have a web development team and the copywriter needs to hand off something to the designer and the designer needs to be overseen by the creative director. Well, that's three people creating these touch points. The, the complexity just multiplies immediately and you immediately get slowdowns in your output because this person posts their work and then the next person maybe takes a day, maybe takes two days. And if it was just one person doing both those jobs, you would get this smooth, you know, consistent process. But since it's broken up now across two people who are more specialists, all of a sudden the time that goes into things is just growing and growing. And so we could try to eliminate that with just better handoffs. I, I don't want to let this interview finish and haven't touched on this part of the oh, part of your background. And that's, you know, so you you have a music background. You you know, tell us about that. Well, so um, I first got into drums maybe back in the first grade. I remember seeing the elementary school band uh, and a kid hitting the bass drum in the back, and something was just very impressive about that with me. This big bass drum that he was just <laughs> swinging. He was probably completely out of time and probably you know, not hitting it at the right moments, but I was impressed, and so I started playing drums. I picked up the guitar, and really by the time I was in uh, high school, I had a really fantastic music teacher who was uh, letting me compose uh, orchestra pieces uh, for, and so I got into film scoring. I got into jingle writing by college, and I really liked working within frameworks. I, I liked having a movie and then I had to support that, or I would have, I would produce pop records in college or hip hop or jazz, and I would have a band and I was helping them see their vision. And so uh, people say, well, how did you get from music into software entrepreneurialism? And there's a very common thread if you just recognize that you're in service of somebody else's vision and you're there to support them with creative and talent and you're you're there. And since 80% of the challenge is just showing up and being professional and being a good support person for them and just taking their vision and not taking criticism personally. You, you're, so I'm pulling upon all of those skills that I learned in playing in bands and applying them to our customer service in the tech. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but having a thick skin is, in, I know it's important in business. Um, and of course it's important if, as you're a musician, because you know you put your heart and soul into something and you put it out right. there, people don't like it. It's hard not to take it super hard. Uh, and you ha kind of have to learn not to, you know, you just have to learn to just right. push on. I mean, I, I mean, imagine the pressure of uh, having the president of the largest advertising agency sitting behind you as you're just editing some music and uh, you're, you're on, you have to listen to every word and just satisfy them in between uh, rounds of sushi that they're ordering. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like an experience you actually had. So <laughs> it's so Many. specific. Um, so how has your experience with music um, helped you even more so with business? 
I really love this question, and we can go as uh, deep down the rabbit hole in in this Feel thought. Says, uh, but um, my my experience with music was really as a producer, and so if you've seen people producing records in music studios, you see that there's lots of, uh, uh, you see a mixing console and there's lots of faders and knobs and all of these things. And you look at the computer screen or you look at the tape and there's all these meters going all the time. And so as the producer, you're, you're overseeing all of that and you're, you know, dialing in the snare drum a little bit, or you're pulling back the vocals a little bit, or you're at, you're deciding that a guitar solo is going to go here, or you're deciding that there's going to be a vocal chorus here. And I see the complex, and at the end of a lot of work and a lot of love and a lot of input, you finally have a finished pop or a record that is worthy of playing for somebody. And there's a lot of complexity that goes into, there's a lot of interlapping parts and overlapping and so I see business, especially small business and, and every size business as having that same kind of complexity that you're you're just running plays and you're you're practicing that, well, this little step needs a little bit more vocals or this little step of the process needs that little bit more snare drum in that email. And so I, I look at the business process as being just this fluid um this fluid organism that that you're constantly just mixing and, and pulling the levers of and that's what we ultimately want as a business as a business that we have control over we could see all of the layers in front of us we could see the meters of responses and inputs and reports and conduct things so that the public can consume our art our business efficiently you know that's interesting because i remember one of my first um, jobs as a software developer. And, you know, they tell you, all right, I need you to build this new thing. And it's not something that's in existence yet. You're going to build this thing. And, you know, you sit sure. down, you open up your IDE and it's just an empty screen. There's nothing there. Um, and then you improvise, you start, okay, I needed to do this. How do I make it do that? All right, here's what I do. And when you're done, you have all these lines of code and then you have a product that, you know, does what, Ever you improvised it to do and i mean it's a lot like music you know you 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 can take like this guitar right here and it's just you know some wood some metal some strings some knobs and you right. know you plug it into an amplifier and you turn it on and you'll get noise but that's about all you're going to get is noise until you learn right. how to improvise with it and make it make music um that's really interesting i never really gave that a thought about um software development and music and how interrelated they actually can be um and it does take like if you think about if you're writing a song you go down a road and you go i don't like that part i need to change that part well it's no different than you might look at your ui and say you know why did i use that when i could have just used this instead let me switch that out you know but that's what we get we encourage all of our business we have a, a phrase for it we call it we call it the touch points and so the, every every moment along the customer journey is a touch point. It's like the song tapping their ear. And so if you're a bakery, well, you have a customer that just came through your door and you service them, but you have a customer that haven't they haven't yet arrived at your door yet, but they are going to arrive. It's, it is in their future. So, um, but they might experience the sign that you have out. Or if they were making a, a, an appointment with you, they might be experiencing an email that is a, a pre-appointment email, like the text that I got before I came on the right. show to remind me to, to be here on time. And so, but then those are touch points and we could easily eval, of course, a text is a touch, an email is a touch point. But the way that the uh, person greets somebody at the door and the way that the sign is and the shirts that the people are wearing and just what they're coached to say uh, is those are all touch points that the entrepreneur, the business owner has control over. And if I had a retail store, you would be experimenting with a blue shirt, a white shirt, a black shirt. Right a polo shirt or this, you would experiment with what happens when we greet people on the phone like this or with that. And so it's the same thing of an artist or a poet, just taking out little words, tweaking little words. And that's really the job of the entrepreneur. That's that. That's a small business owner growing and maturing into an entrepreneur when they start to look at their business in the way that we're talking about. That's interesting because just yesterday, I did a little bit of work out of a local Starbucks. I just felt like a different environment. So I went over there for that. 
And I happened to start a conversation with a guy because this particular Starbucks is like maybe two weeks old. They just opened it. And the people in there are still like, you know, on the top of their training and everything. And you walk in and it's welcome in, welcome in, you know, every single person. And he says to me, I hate that they do that. It doesn't have any effect at all on anybody. Nobody cares. Nobody even pays attention to it. So I looked at it and all I said was, and yet here we are talking about it. Right. Like, yeah. like, why are we, why are we talking about it? If it has no impact, it obviously has an impact. Positive, well, negative, it has an impact. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is that I think that businesses have to have the courage of their convictions and you have to have the courage to be authentic to who you are and to do what you think is right at the time and let the chips fall where they may. And some people, some customers are going to buy into that and others just aren't. Well, and the ones who don't aren't your customer more than likely. I mean, if you're being authentic and I really totally agree with you on that, I think um, I've probably only quote fired three clients in my entire career but they deserved it when i look back they shouldn't have worked i should never have worked with them in the first place and for me the key has been going forward learning to recognize that before i engage with them and not after i've engaged with them for a while but when you can be your authentic self um and people don't want to accept that well then they're probably not the right person to work with your business um because if they if they gelled with you with your concept your authentic self then they're the right person you're gonna not you're gonna have less friction i mean we talked about friction early on and mm -hmm. that's a huge one so what has been like your so so with your business cedric um what's been the biggest challenge that you've had so yeah so the biggest challenge saw so where do I even go with that? There's so many challenges <laughs> in, in being a, a small business. We've, um, this has really been a passion, uh, a labor of love for us. And uh, we've, we've built a software company that is more like a, a boutique agency. And so we've suffered from many of the same challenges that others have suffered from, but the, the one that sticks out the most uh, for me has been, not the product development, because I I don't know if those watching, oh, that guy's an engineer. They, they could tell that I'm more of the engineer minded. And so product development wasn't a problem. I, I I churned through that. I just, I wish I had 10 times as many programmers. Uh, but what was really challenging was finding messaging that really resonated, that 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 encapsulated the the value proposition that we really delivered in a way. Uh, that could be understood in, in in quick talking points, and so uh, I'm I'm really proud of where how far we've come in uh, being able to convey our messaging. And so it was really a, a messaging and a branding problem to to find authentically resonant messaging that that we felt comfortable with. But I do want to add to that, and so and 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 along the way you're not afraid to ask for help. And so I encourage everybody to just ask for help, ask for help. And, and we would ask for help, you know, give me some advice here. Give me some, because we were, we have, we're fortunate to have a very you know, good circle of very intelligent entrepreneurs all around us and advisors and a lot of well-intentioned bad advice. Mm -hmm. And so um, having to digest through that and then at the end emerge with our own true authentic messaging uh, I'm really proud of. Yeah, I know that's, that's excellent. Congratulations on that. So I like to ask most of my guests this next question. So let's see where, where it goes with you. Um, we're going to talk about AI. And what I want to know is your opinion of AI, whether you think it's a good or a bad thing and why, and what do you think the future holds for AI? Um, I'm not going to pretend to be uh, on the forefront of it, but I've dabbled more than than many, probably. Uh, and we love it as a tool. We I use it almost every day. My team uses it every day. Um, we do a lot of data migration. And so being, I was always really good at Excel in terms of cleaning up other clients' data. And so I've used it to create Excel formulas that I would have never been able to conceive of 
uh, and, and converting QuickBooks reports into other kinds of formats and searching queries and going down columns and all of this. And so in that sense, it's helped me get through some really, really specific jobs in ways that I would have had to use brute force humans to to just go through. And so I, I provided really, really great value by just knowing that Excel was capable of something, but then not knowing exactly how to do it, then going to the AI to do it. And so uh, I love that aspect of it. I think that we're going to look at AI in a few years as just another one of those tools where, um, how do I say it? It's that um, we used to think many things were precious until they can become you know, bulk created. You know, every every piece of clothing 300 years ago, 200 years ago was made by hand. Every book was hand stamped um, and until the printing press. Uh, and then when we had home printers and then we could publish our own books and we could publish our own music. And so it's it's taking the, the grunt work out of uh, doing uh, creative projects and, and it's it's enhancing our ability to create more output. And so in terms of a societal shift, uh, I don't know, I wish we had like maybe Neil deGrasse Tyson next to me to maybe help me give word <laughs> to some of my thoughts here, but it's going to, it's going to keep pushing us more advanced, more advanced. And, uh, I'm not afraid of it at all. Um, I really invite whatever's coming next, uh, down the pike, if it could help us be more efficient, get on to conquering the next challenge quicker, conquering the next challenge quicker. I always notice that with with AI prompts, um, if you've got any kind of experience writing software, um, it's a lot easier. I, I see my wife sometimes struggling with something and I read what she wrote and I'm like, this is perfect except for two things are missing here. You got to add this and this. Right. If you add those two things, you're going to get the direction you want to go with this. But if you don't, it's going to kind of spit something out at you and you're going to be like, no, that isn't what I asked for. And she always says, how do you know that? And I'm like, it's just experience. You just know, you you know, the right. machine, you, you speak the machine's language, essentially. I mean, and that's really what you're doing is you're, you're taking the, whatever that AI engine is back behind it, and you're giving it instructions so that it outputs something that works for you. And it's no different than, you know, writing line after line, after line, after line of like, you know, dot net code, for instance, I mean, it's really no difference. And I would advise just people to, to just, again, be careful with it. There's, yeah. you know, you want to be careful with what you input into these things. You want to be careful with how you use it. And if you think that you're using it for particularly sensitive use cases, you need to, you know, figure out something besides just the publicly available models and uh, just uh, you know, use it wisely and responsibly. Yeah. I don't think people either realize either that, it's no, I mean, there, there's a, a very famous story about when um, Apple introduced Siri and mm -hmm. um, people wanted to know how the second version was so much better than the first version, huh. including like how much humor it had. And what, what they didn't like, what I personally didn't love when I heard this is Apple was taking everything that everyone was saying and recording it and holding on to it. And then they were having a team go through that and be like, oh, we didn't think people would ask for that. Here, let's write some way for it to work. But beyond that, some of the dumb things that people ask it, they created um, funny responses to come back from it. And right. that's one of people's biggest questions was, well, how the hell do, does it know that I'm going to ask it that? Well, because a billion other people have asked it that and they've decided to write an answer to it. And my point in bringing that story up is that everything you put into the AI interface, they're storing it somewhere, they're keeping it. And to your point about sensitive you know, use cases, you really probably should have some kind of a private platform that you're using if you're gonna be in that case. Well, this has really been a, a great conversation. Um, I've enjoyed having you here. Um, why don't you let the people know where they can connect with you if they wanna, if they wanna connect? Yeah, so um, anybody who uh, likes what we have to say or wants to hear more uh, can visit segwick.com, S-E-G, W I K. Uh, there we have a lot of great information. You could book with me. I'd love to uh, uh, talk with anybody out there and just hear uh, your your feedback on these topics. And uh, you know, we always just love to learn from other uh, intelligent and creative people. Awesome. Well, 
I'll make sure that's in the notes and hopefully people reach out to you about that. I think it's um, nice of you to to want to have that kind of conversation. Actually, not a lot of people do. And personally, I think that's the way we learn. Um, but exactly. thanks again for being here. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's it's not easy to take your time in the middle of an afternoon, you know, and sit down with me for 30 minutes and talk tech. But we did it. We did it. it was success. So anyway, well, thanks, everyone, for being here and for watching Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge. Uh, we'll be here again next week with another new episode and another new guest.